الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولو أننا كتبنا عليهم أن يقتلوا أنفسكم أو يخرجوا من دياركم ما فعلوه إلا قليل منهم ولو أنهم فعلوا ما يعظون به لكان خيرا لهم وأشد تثبيتا Inshallah ta'ala in the few moments we have together I was given a topic the title of which is the strangers obviously referred to from a them the last part of which fatuba lil ghuraba then good news and congratulations be to the strangers and this is particularly I thought it was a great topic for you and a, a great hadith to choose to discuss with the youth because we're living in times where it's no shock and you don't need a speaker to tell you that Muslims are looked upon as weird everything we do is strange the way we dress sticks out in the mall the way we stand in line at the airport the camera somehow zooms in on our faces the way we travel at the toll booth and we make the person nervous when they're handing us when they're handing us their change everything about us is weird so much so that if in an election campaign somebody might be Muslim, it can send shockwaves. Not that they are, but the idea of it is too strange, too alien. But this you already know. Why should I give you a speech about something you already know? It's something else I want to share with you and I want to, I want to start with something, especially at the level of the youth. There are some things that are, some of our youth, Allah blesses them with a certain experience. Many of you, you don't have to tell your neighbor or me, this is between you and Allah, many of you are party animals. You did very bad things that your parents had no idea you did. And you were in company that your parents had no idea of its true nature. And you spent a lot of your young energies in directions that can only be attributed to the waswasa of shaitan. And for some divine reason, for some inexplicable mercy from Allah Azza wa Jal. because of it Allah put something in your heart to want to learn something about Islam maybe Allah did that for you when you were attending a conference like this one or he did that for you because of the influence of an older brother or just one khutbah out of nowhere sort of hit you and you decided that you want to learn more about your religion and you started changing and many of you as I'm talking you can think of the times in your own life that you would rather not share in public that you know about and nobody else knows about and at that time everybody around you thought you were normal the things you did were normal you used to go out to the movies with your friends and that was normal you used to go play with your friends that was normal some of you guys used to go on the basketball court and use filthy language and that was normal that was just part of every day but then you started changing and for you, you personally thought this changes for the better Things are getting better. You're becoming a better Muslim. You're coming closer to a, recognizing your purpose for why you're alive, why you exist. But as you started finding your purpose, everybody around you started thinking that you're weird. You're changing. So your friends, they don't look at you the same way anymore. And they don't really call you when they go hang out because you, you're acting funny. And you've started to look funny while, while all of you, for, the, for you brothers, all of your friends are really obsessed with over 45 minutes standing behind, behind a mirror fixing that pencil thing you're growing your beard and it's completely not in line with the fashion sense required of the times so you don't really you don't you, you don't fit in so you start losing some of your friends and then after on top of everything else your parents say to you you're becoming a little too muslim i mean we're all muslim but you're becoming muslim muslim and that's a problem for the sisters all of your friends are obsessed with the way their hair looks and their makeup and everything else and you've changed you put your hijab on and all of a sudden your friends don't really associate with you they find it intimidating they'd rather not go I know you know some, some people from my own family distant cousins and stuff they wouldn't go to a gathering where they're, they know they're going to be women in hijab because they find them scary they're too weird I don't want to go to those hijabi people's parties 
Those are people aren't normal. Okay? So now you've become strange not only to non-Muslims, but what I want to share with you is perhaps many of you feel that you have become a stranger in your own family. Your own parents think you've gone crazy. Your own older sister, your own husband, your own wife, your own kids, your own extended family, your cousins, they've turned you into the object of ridicule. So come any Eid gathering, guess who they're going to be mocking? It's going to be you. And all for what? Because you've shown some signs of Islam. Maybe it's in your appearance. Maybe it's a beard for the brothers. Or a little bit more modest dressing. You're not wearing that 50 cent t-shirt anymore. Right? Or your pants aren't dragging two feet behind you when you walk. Maybe that's changed. Right? And we don't know the brand of your garments. Because the labels aren't sticking out. Maybe you don't know that anymore, you've, you've humbled your dress. Maybe for the sisters, you've started to wear a jilbab, you've started to cover yourself appropriately. And that's become the reason you're weird. Sometimes it's in our appearance. Sometimes it's in our behavior. You refuse to go to this gathering where there's going to be stuff. And you all know what stuff that is. And your entire family wants to go and they're saying, why aren't you going? It's your uncle. It's your cousin's wedding. Does Islam teach you to break family ties? Is that what you, this is what your Islam teaches you, to disobey your parents? And you sit there and you listen and you say, yeah, well, I guess I should, should go party. Because Islam says I should listen to my parents this time. And you go. But now you've become the object of, you know, everybody ascribes strangeness to you within your own circle, within your own family. Maybe even in your own workplace. Especially, you know, it's, it's okay for a stranger to see you as strange. Maybe you're used to that already. Maybe before 9-11 it wasn't about you being Muslim, it was you, you, know, you being colored in any way. If you're a little bit less, less than a shade of off-white, then people look at you funny anyway. So maybe it's a new weird. It's not the old weird anymore. So you, maybe you're used to that. But now there's a new thing added on. Your own family. Your own loved ones. Everybody thinks you're strange. You're being alienated entirely. And I wanted to discuss really... If some of you feel that you can relate to what I'm saying, I wanted to discuss at the heart of this problem, the heart of this weirdness that everybody sees around Muslims. What is the root of it? You know, our beautiful religion, this way of life that Allah has granted us, is called Al-Islam. And one of its meanings is complete submission. And you all know that already. Probably you learned that in Sunday school or earlier. That Islam means complete and absolute submission to the will of Allah. But you know, when you read, when you were a kid or you were in Sunday school, you heard in a khutbah the stories of the prophets, you heard them. You said, yeah, I know that story. Or you learned those stories and you appreciated them. But when you put them in a modern context, when you go back and reflect on those stories, then you'll find something else. Not too long ago, I was listening to NPR. It's about a year ago. And there was a comedian on NPR. And she was actually talking about the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Fairly accurately, except for the Ismail and Ishaq part that they confused the Christian. Fairly accurate depiction. And you know what she was saying? What kind of God is this? It makes you kill your own kid. If anybody wants, you know, you all know that Ibrahim was given revelation to attempt to slaughter his own son. You know this already, right? Now, she says, well, nowadays, if somebody says, God told me to kill my kid, what would you do with them? And you answer that for me, what would you do with them if somebody said, God told me to kill my kid? They'd end up in the psych ward, or worse, right? Child services, 911, something. This person is not normal. This person is insane. But why do we then have so much admiration for this man, Abraham to them, Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? And when she put it in that way, it makes you think. At the, not just our behavior nowadays, not just our salah at the airport or at the mall, not just our, the way we look and the way we dress, not just the fact that we say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah or somebody overhears you say alhamdulillah and they turn, oh my god, I think I heard that in a movie before an explosion happened, you know? <laughs> not that, not any of that. This goes way back. The messengers alayhim salatu was salam displayed submission before Allah. And the world at large looked at that as strange. That was strange. And what the world sees as crazy, we define as the greatest gift that Allah has given us, the willingness, willingly coming before Allah and giving ourselves in complete submission to Him. So our heroes, our messengers, alayhim are those who were the role models of submission. 
What the West looks at as craziness, we look at as the best role models of, for, for humanity. Because if Allah wants you to do something, no matter how crazy you think it is, it's better for you. Because we know Allah knows better what, what's better for us. I'm not giving you an edu- educational speech. I think you know already, enough already. I'm just here to try to remind myself and you of some basic things. Some very basic things. Allah Azza wa Jal, he, he commands us to do things and you know what He commands us to do. You all, most of you know what's haram and what's halal already. Yet you find yourself still, still doing those things and being tempted towards the haram. And so here, I'm going to take a step back and share something with you about psychology. This was my first psychology course. It was abnormal psychology in advanced psych. And you know how ad- abnormal behavior, abnor- abnormal psychological behavior, you know how that's defined? That's defined as someone behaving in a way that nobody else behaves in. Like if you start acting in a way that nobody around you acts in, or dressing in a way that nobody around you dresses that way, or speak in a way that nobody around you speaks that way, then by definition you are acting abnormally, you're weird. There's something psychologically wrong with you. And this is supposedly a modern definition of abnormal behavior. But look at our messengers, alayhi salatu wasalam, all of them. They come before people and they say that Allah has given them a message. Does anybody else say that in their society? No, they're the only ones. They're the only ones who have received revelation. And what do you find from ancient times? What do people call them? People call them insane. Now, people say when you say something nobody else is saying, you're crazy. You're, you're, uh, psychologically, you've got an abnormality you suffer from. You have to figure out what it is. And in the times of the messengers, in the ancient times also, like our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people call him insane. They called him insane because he called for something nobody else had. So this is something, a background that I wanted to set for you in dealing with this subject of strangeness. In, interesting that in that hadith, that, that warmth and that comfort that our messenger وسلم, gives us is with the word tuba. And tuba is a beautiful word. It has the meaning of congratulations in it. It has a meaning of a, a news that you get and when you get it, your heart settles. It relaxes. You're calm. And this is the same congratulations that is given to us if Allah, by Allah's mercy we all enter Allah's Jannah. Tibtum. All of you have this happiness that leads to tranquility, your calm. You're fine, you can finally relax. There's no anxiety left. This is the calm and this is the, the happiness that Allah's, Allah's Messenger promised us in this hadith وسلم, for those who will be considered strange. And what will be strange about them? The whole premise of my talk, they will decide to submit themselves to the will of Allah. That's what's going to be weird about them. They're going to be strange for that weird about them. They're going to be strange for that reason. So now, having set that foundation, I want to take this a step further and just talk a little bit about religions in general. And we'll come to Islam at the end. Nowadays, religions have also been redefined. Religions have also been redefined. We've gone through the last 20, 30 years of this interfaith dialogue and postmodernism, and you know, there's this idea that all humanity can get along. And the thing that really divides us in history are these religious wars. Religions clashed against each other, so if we can get these different religions to get along with each other, humanity would be united. Sounds really fluffy and happy and nice. And so all these organizations and movements and intellectuals come together and they sit and discuss Christianity compared to Judaism, compared to Hinduism, compared to Islam, compared to Buddhism or whatever else. Even atheists can sit at the table, agnos. Let's everybody just sit together, hold hands and talk about what we share, our humanity. This universal religious idea. And you know, save the atheist, what are some things that every religion has in common? It's an idea of God, right? Every religion believes in some sort of God. Whether they have some shirk involved in that belief or not, that's a separate story. But across religions, there's this deity. There's this divine being. So at least, you know, the phrase which is, to us it's shirk, but it's common English terminology, children under God, or children of God, <laughs> right? We say slaves of Allah, ibadullah, right? Creations of Allah, not his children. But this terminology is developed. The reason I'm telling you this is because what makes the label that this religion or that religion is extreme, this religion is extreme or that religion is extreme, they don't fit within this normal, happy, let's get along and sing together 
picture of religion is that there is somebody in their religion that makes them unique, that makes them stand out from everybody else. And this is actually a messenger, alayhi salam. I mean, what makes all the religions different? Each of them has a different messenger. Some individual who stands between them and the unity of people. So they, in modern times, look at messengers as a means by which people are divided. God is the same. We can get everybody to agree that there's a God. That's good. That's the good part. But not everybody can agree on Isa alayhi salam. You know, some people don't agree on him. Not, not most people can agree on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So might as well de-emphasize these messengers. Let's just emphasize God. And the rest, you know, it's fine. Then we'll be united. And this idea subconsciously has appealed to many Muslims, unfortunately. Subconsciously, not consciously, subconsciously. Consciously, our kalima includes the messenger, doesn't it? Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna. Can I hear this, please? Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. La ilaha illallah. Muhammadun rasulullah. This is part of our indoctrination into Islam. We enter into the citizenship of Islam by saying this two part statement. So, consciously, we can never de emphasize one or the other. We can't. But you know how this is happening subconsciously? Let's talk about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a profound leader. Let's talk about him as a great father, as a negotiator, as a wise man, as an honest man, as a man who never cheated anybody in business, someone who was a great husband, someone who was an awesome friend, right, etc., etc. All these great things about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what is the first thing you have to know about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That he is the Rasul of Allah. Muhammadun Rasulullah Everything Muhammad al-Sadiq Al-Ameen Right The father the, the, the trustworthy The noble All of those attributes are true But before you get introduced To any of those attributes What's the first thing we know About Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu That he's the messenger of Allah And as a messenger What does he demand He doesn't just demand To be appreciated He doesn't just demand To be preyed upon Not just a spiritual leader This is another thing Modern religion wants They want a spiritual leader For every religion So they'll say That the spiritual leader Of Islam is Muhammad In some respect That's true But that's not The entire truth Our messenger Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam By definition All these messengers Came and they said This two part thing Fattakullaha Wa ati'oon Have taqwa of Allah Be conscious of Allah That's the first thing Correct your relationship with Allah. And the next part, how do you correct that relationship? وَأَطِيعُونِي Obey me. If you want to correct your relationship with Allah, you have to obey the messenger. And in our case, Muhammadun Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why am I sharing all of this with you in a talk about strangers? Because it's within our own ranks. Within the Muslim community itself. The tragedy of the people who say La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The tragedy of these people themselves is Many of them they say Well this is in the Quran but it's not in the Sunnah Or it's in the Sunnah what's, It's just a hadith you don't have to take it that seriously Where is it in the Quran? So people will question the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As though it's secondary It's not really that important It's not really of primary importance But you see when you turn to the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal protects not only the book of Allah but also the sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, all of this is important because what makes us strange is our love and our obedience and our allegiance to this man Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The, the legal definition of Iman even by Ibn Hajar Rahimahullah is Dastiqul Rasul. Al Iman Dastiqul Rasul, the first part. Iman is defined not as faith in Allah first but faith in and confirmation in the Messenger first, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he will tell you about Allah. You might have incorrect beliefs about Allah. Who can correct those beliefs is the Messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what makes us strange is allegiance to his sunnah. What makes us strange is the love of being like him. Taking his words more than the weight of gold. His advice... His concerns are more valuable to us than anything else the world has to offer. And this is what makes us Uraba. And when you have this love of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the messenger congratulates you. Congratulations on being weird, on being strange. You see the ayah I started with and I recited before you. By the way, how much time do I have? I don't want to take a second more. Fifteen more minutes, very good. The ayah I started with talks about obedience to Allah. 
In Suratul Nisa, Surah number 4, this is ayah number 66. وَلَوْ أَنَّا كَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْ يَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ أَوْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ If Allah had ordained, I'm paraphrasing what the ayah says. Imagine that Allah commanded us to kill ourselves or to become homeless, leave our homes. If the command from Allah was leave your homes or kill yourselves. Two commands that if I go, don't go any further, if I didn't tell you Allah told me to, uh, Allah said so. If I just said to you, you know what we should all do? We should all kill ourselves. Or we should all, despite owning a home, we should become homeless. Or besides, despite having an apartment, we should just leave our homes. Does that make logical sense to you? Killing yourself makes no logical sense. Leaving your home doesn't make any logical sense. But Allah says, had Allah said it, then first, ما فعلوه إلا قليل منهم Most of them would not have done it at all. Even if Allah told them, they wouldn't have done it at all. وَلَوْ فَعَلُوا مَا يُعَضُونَ بِهِ And if they had done what they were being advised to do, لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ That would have certainly been better for them. If it makes sense to you or doesn't make sense to you, has become irrelevant. If Allah said it, then it's definitely better for you. The only one who can accept that is someone who despite any argument and any criticism and any pressure from anyone else accepts what Allah says is better for me and what He takes, what he forbids is harmful for me. They accept that. And no other argument is more convincing to them than the word of Allah. That's enough for them. وَأَشْهَدَّ تَثْبِيتَ It would have been a more firm decision. That would have been the right thing to do. That would have shown their character. Even if Allah asked us to do that, that would have been better for us. Not that He did. But even if he did, it would have been better. Another part of our, of our book that I want to share with you very quickly, inshaAllah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرِ وَالْفُسُوقِ وَالْعِسْيَانِ Surah Al-Hujurat. Allah says, Allah has made Iman something beloved to you. Allah made it so that you Muslims, you love Iman. You love having it. You treasure it. And when you have a treasure, you hate to lose it, right? If you have nothing to lose, then you don't lock your doors because you got nothing in the house. But if you have a treasure in your house, something really valuable, you got this cash, you haven't deposited it yet. It's sitting in the house. You're going to lock all the doors and make sure it's in a safe place, right? We have this iman, we treasure it. Because Allah made it beautiful to us. He beautified it in your hearts. Now Iman, when you think of Iman, the first thing that comes to mind is Iman in Allah, isn't it? When you think of Iman, it's the remembrance of Allah, the dhikr of Allah, right? The faith, the, the trust in Allah, the gratitude towards Allah Azza wa Jalla. These are the things that come to mind. You know how this same ayah begins? وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ You had better know that among you is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِدْتُمْ If he was to follow you in most issues, then you would all be harmed. The first part of the ayah talks about, you better recognize that among you, Allah has not just sent anyone, He has sent the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you, instead of He obeying you, how should things be? You should be obeying Him. And once you do that, then Allah says, Iman has been made beautiful for you. Iman in what? Iman in this messenger. Iman in this real faith in our hearts that what he advises is better for us. What he has to offer us is the best prescription for our life. And once you have that in your heart, then being strange is a wonderful thing. And until you don't have that, if you don't have that, then being strange is depressing. You are depressed that your family ridicules you. You are sad that people look at you funny when you go outside. You're, you're just you're estranged when you sit in the classroom in college or somebody passes a remark. You get saddened. You know, you feel low self-esteem. But if this faith is in your heart, this, this love of obeying the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa if that's in your heart, then every time you hear those things, you are reminded that you are strange and so this calm takes over you. فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَى It's a different attitude. These are the people who love and follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah make us from them. So now I lastly end with you with Allah's mention of His favor. No doubt Allah already 
bestowed his incredible favor upon the true believers. Is ba'atha fihim rasulam minhum when he raised a messenger from among them. Look at the favor of Allah in this ayah. The favor of Allah is that he appointed Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is his favor. The last and final thing, inshaAllah ta'ala, and I'm done, but I have no more to share with you, is in regards to the pressures our youth, many of you, my younger brothers and sisters, face in this society. Constantly, constantly, without fail, you will be exposed to that which is good and that which is harmful, that which is success and that which is failure, that which looks good and that which looks ugly. You will constantly be bombarded with these two definitions of what is awesome and what is terrible. A new movie is going to come out and you're going to say, I got to go see it. A new sneaker is going to come out and you're going to say, I have to buy that sneaker. Or this new video game is going to be released and you're going to say, I have to buy this game. You will constantly be obsessed with entertaining yourself. That's good for you. You'll be constantly obsessed with your fashion, your appearance, your beautification. You'll be obsessed with these things, constantly being bombarded with these things. So whether you're on the computer and you hit Facebook or you go on YouTube, you'll be, you'll be you know, pumped with this false definition. Or you hit up your iPods and you go and you surf on the internet, you'll be hit with this definition. When you see a billboard, when you see a billboard on the highway, you're going to be pumped with this definition, this wrong definition of what you want. You'll be, you'll be, basically you'll be brainwashed into wanting things and wanting things and wanting things. But we have to reverse this brainwashing sequence. And how do we do so? Number one, my, my serious advice to all of my younger brothers and sisters. My serious advice. Cut down your intake of garbage. Cut down your intake of garbage. And you know what I mean. I don't have to spell it out for you. Whether it's been downloaded on your PSP or your iPod or you're doing that on your laptop, cut it down. Replace it with something beneficial. And the best thing you can do for yourself in this age is surround yourself with other weirdos. And by that I mean friends that are in love with the sunnah of the Messenger Be friends with people that are better than you. Find people that you really think they're better people than you are and be friends with them, spend time with them. Not with people you think you're going to try to help them. You're not going to help anybody. You're just going to get messed up yourself. That's what's going to happen. That's really what's going to happen. So brothers in this, in this uh, audience inshallah ta'ala when you go back to your local communities make it a project to be at the masjid Fajr and Aisha just, just make that decision that you're going to be there you will find wonderful people in the house of Allah maybe a lot older than yourself but it will give you maturity when you hang out with people like that the people who love the obedience of Allah the ibadah to Allah Azza wa Jal the people who love to remember Him the people who fulfill the great sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam sisters find yourself other sisters that are role models in their knowledge in their worship in their remembrance of allah in their obedience to allah surround yourselves with these people you need this at this age i am telling you the, the, the words of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and I'm, i promise i'm done i promise i'm done you know this is the scariest and the most profound hadith in, to my knowledge about this issue about the youth al mar'u ala dini khalili a man depends on the religion of his friend. An individual depends on the religion of his friend. Then watch out who you make a friend. Look out for who you, you better know who you're making friends with. Because your religion is entirely dependent upon the religion of your friend. You want to maintain that tranquility in your heart? Find yourself good company. May Allah Azza wa grant all of our youth good company, a company that betters their character and strengthens it, and gives them a love, a continued and growing love of the sunnah of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah Azza wa protect our youth from all the trials that surround them, and let their hearts not be saddened by any of the pressures, and any of the attacks, and any of the attempted humiliations that are waged against them, because they have the greatest honor of all. They have the honor of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. With that I conclude. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله